Well, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us today at Relentless Church. We're thankful that you would come and worship with us. Um, if you are new or haven't met me yet, my name is Mason and I'm the director of global outreach here at the church. And today I get to continue us in our series going through the book of Galatians. Uh, if you were with us last week, you know that we got through the first half of uh, chapter three in the book of Galatians. And today we're going to be finishing off uh, the last half of chapter three. Um, so part of today, I know you guys, uh, if you have seen, you guys got a worksheet that's on your chair. We do have a plan for that. Um, I know some of y'all probably like couldn't even worship because you're thinking about like, what are we doing with the worksheet? Um, and so what we really wanted to do is we wanted to just have uh, kind of some space at the end of the message, more so for reflection. Um, we know that throughout this series, we've talked a lot about the gospel. Um, and that's really been the whole point of this series. And that's actually the reason why Paul's writing this letter to the Galatians is in, de in defense of the gospel. Um, but I know for me, like I can hear that word so much. And I think just in church in general, we can hear the gospel um, a lot, which isn't a bad thing, that's a good thing. Um, but sometimes we can hear that or hear that word so often that maybe to some of us, it starts to kind of like lose what it really means or what the value of it is. Um, like we just kind of throw the word gospel into everything, right? Like we have gospel music, we have books about the gospel, we talk about it. Um, but like, when was the last time that like each one of us really just sat down and was wowed by what Jesus has done for us and what God has said that he's done for us through the gospel? Um, like I know for me, I was just thinking about that this week of just like, when was the last time I really reflected on who I was before Jesus found me? Um, like I love living in the freedom of Christ and living, knowing that God loves me, but when's the last time I just was grateful for what he has brought me through and what he saved me from? And just realizing of like, do we live in that reality every day? Cause like we can come to church, we can sing the songs and say, God loves me. Um, but am I really waking up every day and just living in that truth of like, there's a creator, like a being that literally knit you together. And just to think that he loves me, that he's pleased with me, that it's not about anything that I can do today. But if I could just live in that love, like that's life um, at its best. Or beyond that, like looking outwardly, thinking about the gospel, do we look at the people in our lives and do we love them unconditionally? Or do we um, kind of expect people to earn our love, right? Like, do we think that our love towards them is based off of what they do or based off of their actions? Um, do we look at the way that God has loved us as explained by the gospel and think, okay, if Jesus has really loved me that way, then I'm just gonna love the people in my life today. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say to me. If they're my friends or if they're, they're my enemies, I'm just gonna show them the grace of God. And so that's why we wanna take some time uh, at the back end of the message again, just to have a couple of minutes to really just reflect and just think about the gospel and how it applies to each and every one of our lives. Um, and so that being said, uh, we got, we're gonna try to keep it to about 30 minutes and I've got 10 pages of notes. And so we're gonna just jump in. Um, so if you've got a Bible, again, we're gonna be in Galatians chapter three. Um, but again, the reality is, is that we need the gospel. We need this truth each and every moment of every day for the rest of our lives. That's why Paul writes this letter. Um, but what we want you guys again to see is that it's not that, that this letter is just written to the Galatians. Like Paul wrote it to the Galatians, but God sovereignly has placed this in scripture because it's written to us. And so I just know like I can read through this and be like, oh man, the Galatians were dumb, you know? <laughs> like you can just kind of see them through that lens and not think about, oh no, like this is me that Jesus is talking to. Like I'm the one that needs to receive this. Um, and so Paul is writing this because the Galatians had forgotten about the gospel. Um, people were coming into the church and were telling them that in order to be seen as righteous before God, they needed to uphold certain works of the law. Uh, so in essence, they were saying that Jesus was not enough. And so Paul's whole mission in writing this letter is to defend the gospel, that we're saved by faith alone in what Jesus has done for us. Um, and so last week we read, he, he kind of gives this accusation against the Galatians, and it's pretty pointed in what he says, like he calls them foolish. He says, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has led you away from the truth that I first gave you? And you can see his passion behind it. Again, Paul's opponents were saying that Christ wasn't enough, that you need faith in Jesus and to uphold the law to be seen as righteous before God. And so part of the analogy that he gets into last week and he dives deeper into this week is Paul then is in response to that, he's gonna go look at a figure in scripture, uh, Abraham, 
and he's looking at him specifically because Abraham lived 430 years before God sent the Mosaic law into the world. And so Paul is saying, okay, like you think that the law justifies you, let's take a step back and let's go look at Abraham who lived 430 years before the law to show that it was always about righteousness through faith. Um, Because Paul believes that God showed the world in Abraham's story the reality that we can be made righteous through faith and not by works. And so he says this to the Galatians uh, in verse five of chapter three. He asks them, does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul says Abraham was considered righteous before the law was even set into place, not because Abraham was righteous, not because he upheld the law, but because he had faith in what God had promised him. And so this week, he's going to dive in verses 15 to 29 even deeper into that example of Abraham uh, to show us that that's always been the case, that it's always been about faith and not about our works. And so for us, like the Galatians would have known this story about uh, Abraham. Paul specifically is looking at a story in Galatians, or sorry, Genesis 15. Uh, And so his readers would have known this story. For us, we have to kind of dig deeper into it and go look at it. And so we're going to kind of follow Paul through that story. But I think we're going to see four points uh, that Paul is trying to make to the Galatians today. And so the first point is this, is that the gospel was the plan from the beginning. That the gospel wasn't a plan that just came along after a while when God said, oh my gosh, okay, the world has just gone astray in sin. Like, let me send my son Paul is saying, no, this was the plan from the beginning was for Jesus Christ to come into the world. The second thing he's going to say is that the law then points to Jesus, that the law is not meant to justify. The law was meant to point us to Jesus. The third thing he's going to say is that the law then was our guardian until Jesus. And so that the law basically oversaw us and helped steward God's people until Jesus would come. And then the last thing he's going to say is that God's plan then is to justify men through faith in Jesus alone and not by works of the law. So if you're a note taker, that's where we're going. We're going to touch on each of those today. But today we're going to start with that first point, that the gospel was the plan from the beginning. Uh, Now for us as Christians, that's important to know uh, that the gospel was the plan from the beginning. Because if we read the scripture, if we read through the Bible and we see that God has changed or that God's inconsistent, or that God is just kind of doing things that don't match up, we probably shouldn't believe in that God. But if we can look at scripture and we, if we can read it and be like, this actually gives us a depiction of how the world came to be. Like this actually explains how all of us are here now. And it seems like God's doing a work in creation that's pointing specifically to this person of Jesus Christ. Like if we can read every single story and see, oh man, like it wasn't that this was just something that happened or again, that God just randomly sent Jesus into the world. But if we can say, man, for thousands upon thousands of years, God is doing things that are building and building and building towards Jesus. That gives us assurance in our faith. That encourages us to know, okay, like this is really what has happened in the history of the world. And this is really what God is doing in reconciling humanity to himself. And so we're going to follow Paul as he goes back to Genesis 15 uh, to see Jesus in the Old Testament and how the gospel was preached even to Abraham. And because it was preached even to Abraham, we'll see how it applies to us today. And so we're going to look a little bit at Abraham's origin story. Um, And so if you you know the story, his name was Abram, and then it got changed to Abraham. So when we read through the scripture, it's going to say Abram a lot. I might say Abraham, same guy, just different name change. Um, And so we're going to look at Abram's origin story. And so when you get to Genesis 11, that's kind of when he's first mentioned. So when you get to Genesis 11, it's the story of the Tower of Babel, if you know that story. So God creates humanity, he makes them in his image, and his command to them is to glorify him, to be in relationship with him, and to go and to fill the whole world. But instead, people in sin turn inwardly, and instead of glorifying God, they begin to glorify themselves and try to make a name for themselves. 
So they come together, they try to build a city and to build a tower to glorify their own names. And God comes down and he scatters them. And God essentially creates nations. He creates people groups and he fills the earth. Um, and so at this point, the world is just corrupt and just falling deeper and deeper into sin. And so in Genesis 11, we read that story about the Tower of Babel, but then it gets deeper into a little bit of a genealogy and it's showing uh, how Abraham came from Adam, the first man. And so as it's going down the genealogy, we get to Abraham's father, whose name was Terah. And it says this in verse 31 of Genesis 11, it says, uh, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah was old, really old. Um, but, and we also know this about Terah, though, from Joshua 24, 2. It says, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Basically what Joshua is pointing to is that reality that Terah was a pagan. Terah worshiped idols and not the one true God. And so by translation, we can probably guess that Abram also probably worshiped idols and not God. There's nothing in the story that points to the reality that Abram knew God, loved God, was praying to him, was seeking him at all. He most likely followed the idol worship of his ancestors. But out of nowhere, in the next chapter, in Genesis 12, verse 1, it says this. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'll show you, and I'll make of you a great nation, and I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So not because Abraham's righteous, not because he's walking with the Lord. It doesn't even say that he was seeking the Lord. But from the looks of it, out of God's own volition, God suddenly just appears in Abraham's life and he blesses him and he gives him a promise and he gives him a directive. Come and follow me to the land that I'll show you. Again, God's plan had always been for people to glorify him and be in relationship with him. And so when mankind fell, God began working in creation to restore all people to himself through his son, Jesus. And now, like we said in Genesis 11, the world's been kind of wandering and wallowing in sin for a couple of years. And so God says, okay, now is the time where I'm going to set my plan in motion and I'm going to pick Abraham to do it. Not because he's righteous, not because he even reveals faith at this point, but God just simply picks him and puts the plan in motion. Now, when we just take a pause for a moment and just think about like what that means for us, the reality is, is like none of us come to God because of our own selves. Um, like, and there's a lot of theological debates around this and about free will and predestination and all this. We're not going to get into all of those today, but like when you just stop and think for a moment that you didn't choose to grow up in a Christian nation. If your family was Christian, you didn't choose to grow up in a Christian family. In a world right now where there are three billion people who have no access to the gospel, meaning three billion people who have not rejected the gospel, but three billion who will live and die without anyone ever telling them God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. In a world where there's three billion people with no access to the gospel, God put you in a place where you could hear the gospel, where you could hear about his love for you, where you could hear about Jesus and gave you the ability to accept him. So when we ask that question of why am I a Christian, is it because you picked God? Because you're a moral person, because you're smarter than your neighbor or your coworker or the three billion people around the world with no access to the gospel? Or is it because God in his grace looked on a world full of sin and he said, I'm going to speak you into motion and I'm going to put you in this place at this time so that I can bring you to myself and make you mine. Like he did with Abram. 
like he did with Paul when he came into Paul's life, like he's still doing around the world. It's crazy to hear stories in some of these Muslim countries, like in the Middle East where there's no access to the gospel and Jesus is appearing to people in dreams and visions and leading them to himself still today. And so this is still happening where Jesus is going out into the world and drawing people to himself. And so again, even when we see that in Abraham, like he picks him for no other reason than he picks him. It's grace. God picks Abram because he loves him and he wants him to be with him and to live this life for him. And the first thing he gives him is a promise. He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'll show you. And I'll make of you a great nation and I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God tells Abram, I'm going to do something in you that is going to bless the whole world. And this is the promise that Paul points to in Galatians 3 that comes before the law that ultimately Jesus is going to step into the world and fulfill. He is Abraham's descendant who's going to bless the nations. And so God gives Abraham this promise. And as Abraham is going, God continuously preaches it to him and says, don't worry, Abraham, I promised this and I'm going to do it. I promised this to you and I'm going to do it. Even when Abram goes down to Egypt and he lies and he tells them his wife is his sister and they take his wife from him. And so God does restore that, like she, he gets his wife back and they continue. But even when Abram goes and he doubts God and he has a child with his servant Hagar instead of with his wife Sarah, even through all of these things, God still is right next to him, walking with him, saying, I, don't worry, Abraham, I promised you I'm going to do this. You're going to have a son and it's going to lead to descendants that will bless the nations. And in Genesis 15, we see something amazing where God makes a covenant with Abraham, literally signs a contract with him. Because uh, there's a problem, right? If you know the story about Abram at all. And the reality is, is that Abram's like a million years old at this point. So it's kind of hard for him to have kids and his wife Sarah's in the same boat. And so he's sitting there wondering, how is God going to fulfill this promise to me? And in Genesis 15, he's voicing that to the Lord. He's curious, like, God, how could you possibly do this in me? So starting in uh, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. This is God speaking to Abram. And God says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So God looked at Abram and he said, because you believed me when I said that, I'm declaring that you are righteous. And Paul's point in writing this to the Galatians is that this is 430 years before the law. That Abraham now stands justified before God, not because of anything he did, but because of what God had done for him. All Abraham had to do was believe and God justified him and declared him as righteous. Now God continues in verse 7, it says, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abram said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? So Abram's looking for a sign. And then God tells him this in verse 9. He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid them each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. Now, for us reading it, that's kind of weird that Abram's like, how are you going to do this? And then God's like, bring me all these animals and cut them in half. Like, but uh, for the Jews reading this, they would have understood this. And so again, we just need a little bit of context, but this is just an excerpt, or an excerpt from Bible.org just explaining what's happening here. Uh, it says, in the ancient world of Abram, Legal and binding agreements were not put on papers written by lawyers and signed by the parties involved. 
Instead, the two parties would arrive at a mutually acceptable agreement, and then they would formalize it in the form of a covenant. The covenant was sealed by the dividing of an animal or animals. In fact, the technical term literally means go cut a covenant. The animal was cut in half, and the two parties would pass between the halves. It seems that in this oath, the men acknowledged that the fate of the animal should be theirs if they broke the terms of their agreement. So basically, like if me and you back in this time, in Abram's time, if we wanted to make an agreement, like if I was selling you my house or something, I don't know, we would come together and we would take these animals and we would cut them in half and me and you would walk through the halves together saying, okay, we're agreeing to do this together. And if either one of us should violate this covenant, let what has happened to these animals happen to us. And so that's what God is setting up here with Abram. He's saying, I'm going to come down and I'm going to give this promise to you. But then something amazing happens in verse 17. It says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So to explain this, biblical commentators see these things, the smoking pot and torch as symbols of God's presence meaning that God himself comes down and walks between the pieces of these animals, signing the covenant to Abram himself. God's making this promise saying, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have many descendants and they're going to bless the nations. And God himself is signing the contract saying that it's going to happen. God's putting his own name, his own reputation on the line and declaring himself as the sole person who will be responsible for fulfilling that promise. And now notice who doesn't walk through it. Abram. There's nothing for him to add to it. God says, I'm going to do this for you. And not only am I promising to do all these things for you, I'm not requiring anything of you in return. It's all going to be on me, on my power, on my strength, and on my abilities. Do we see the gospel in that? That God sees this man, says, come follow me. And when it comes down to it, he gives him a promise saying, I'm going to bless you and bless others through you. And I promise on my own name that I'm going to uphold this. And there's absolutely nothing, Abraham, that you can do to add to that and nothing he's called to do in order to earn that blessing. But what he does is simply believe, and God sees his belief, and he declares that Abram's righteous just because he believed it. This is the point that Paul's making to the Galatians, is that it was never about the law or about us earning God's love and help from the beginning. That it's God who saves, God who picks, God who leads, God who calls and who promises. And all that's left for us is to look at these promises and to believe in what he has said. And it's always been that way from the beginning, from Abraham to Jesus is Paul's point. The law, again, comes after this promise. Paul's opponents were arguing that to be really saved and to become a child of God, you need to follow the law and not just have faith in Jesus. And so Paul is taking a step back here and he's saying, no, look at Abraham and how he was justified by faith before the law ever even came into existence. And Paul's saying this came first before the law, righteousness by faith alone. And so he continues in Galatians 3 verse 15. He says, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. He's saying, if me and you sit down and make a contract and we say we're going to do something, I don't go back afterwards and change the stipulations in the contract. I don't go back and say, okay, now for us actually to continue this, like you need to do these things. And so he's saying, God didn't bring the law in saying that now you need to do this in order to earn my blessings. He continues in verse 16 and says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And so the whole point Paul is making is that in all of this, in everything, in the whole story of creation, is that Jesus is the promised offspring of Abraham who's going to come and who's going to bless all nations. God picks Abraham, gives him this blessing and this amazing vision of how through him every nation is going to be blessed. And then God himself fulfills this promise by sending his son 
into the world. And so Jesus came into the world so that he could be without sin, so that he could die on a cross, so that he could take the sin of the world on his shoulders, so that the Father could raise him up again, so that he could overthrow Satan and reign forever as our king, and so that he could offer forgiveness to people of all nations because of what he had already done on the cross. And so he received the promise given to Abraham because God saw Jesus as righteous. And then as the king of the world, he's able to bring anyone into that promise and into his family simply through faith in what he has done. So God promised himself or promised us that this would happen. And then God himself came into the world to fulfill it. And we add nothing to it, but we just believe in Jesus. The law was never meant to be a way to salvation. Paul continues this in verse 17. He says, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So he says, God didn't add the law to suddenly give Abraham's descendants something to uphold. He made a promise and he would keep it. But then the question remains then of like, why would God even send the law into the world then? If it was always about faith and not about what we do, then why would God even send stipulations for people to follow into the world? Well, it's a great question. It's actually the next question that Paul asks in verse 19. Paul says, why then the law? And he answers, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. So Paul says at the beginning of verse 19, the law came because of sin until Jesus could come into the world. And so what does that mean? Well, again, Paul's going to explain it, and he explains it in kind of two different ways. Uh, The first one is kind of a negative sense, and the next one is kind of a positive sense. But he explains it in verse 21 then. He says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so this is the second point from today's message. What Paul is trying to say about the law is this, is that the law was meant to point us to Jesus. That the law came into the world as an intermediary between Abram and Jesus. So again, it's kind of a negative reason at first, but he says that the the law came into the world to imprison everything under sin. Now that doesn't mean that when the law came into the world, it suddenly made everybody a sinner or it made everybody guilty. The reality is, is that the whole world since the fall of man was already guilty because of their sin. Everybody born was under the judgment and wrath of God because everybody in our hearts, when we come into the world, we love sin more than we love God. But God sent the law to show the world that they stood condemned for their sins. So Paul says, if the law could give life, then we could find righteousness by it. But it couldn't give life because no one in the history of the world was able to uphold the law. The law came into the world to show all people that this is a holy God and these are his standards and no one can measure up to them. That is no one until Jesus comes into the world, which is Paul's point. So the law comes and it magnifies sin and shows us that we all desperately need a savior. So the law was never meant to be our savior. It was meant to show us that we need a savior and that he's coming to save us. And that savior was Jesus. Because when he came, he came as the offspring of Abraham, the only righteous one, the only one who could stand before God and God could look at him and say, he's righteous. So the law magnified sin to point us to our need for Jesus. So the next reason Paul gives is more of a positive reason. And this is point three for us today, is that the law also was our guardian until Jesus. So the law was our guardian until Jesus. He says in verse 23, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, 
in order that we might be justified by faith. So the revelation of the law was meant to show us that we're all sinners so that when Christ comes, we could put our faith in him. Until that point, Paul says that the law was our guardian, meaning that people could look at it and learn from the law who God is. They could learn about his character based off of the law that they had, and they could learn how to follow him based off of the law too. And the law was life. God did tell people, if you abide by this law, if you follow it, if you walk in my ways, it will be life. It'll be joy. It'll be blessings for you. But the reality was is that it was incomplete because at the end of the day, it couldn't offer salvation. And so it was only put in place to be a guardian for a time, to point people to God, to show them how to walk in God's ways for a time until Jesus could come and bring the full revelation and the full salvation of God and offer it to God's people. Which leads us into the last point then today that Paul's trying to, to just give to the Galatians and just remind them of is that if this is all true, if this is all the case, then we become members of God's family through faith in Jesus and not works of the law. So again, if it's true that it's always been about the gospel, that it's always been about faith that saves and not works, and if it's true that the law came just to point us to Jesus, and if the law came just to be our guardian until Jesus, Paul says then it's true for the Galatians then, and it's true for us today, that we all become members of God's family through faith in Jesus alone and not through works of the law. He says in verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you, for as many of you as were baptized in the Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Again, Paul is just pointing to this reality that the law reveals to us our sin and imprisons everyone under it, but Christ came so that he could set you free. He came completely fulfilling the standards of the law in his own life. And he was the only person in human history who could stand before God and God would say, this is a righteous man. And then in the greatest act of love that the universe has ever seen, Jesus allowed himself to be stripped and beaten and mocked and hung on a cross. And not only was he stripped of his own clothing, think about that, like when Jesus went to the cross, he had everything taken from him. And then he goes a step beyond that and chooses to strip himself of his own righteousness. Because it says on the cross that he became sins for us. And so Jesus lays down even his righteousness, the one thing that he had that like God could look at him and say, this is what Jesus offers to the world. Jesus would even lay that down when he goes to the cross and he takes the sin of the world and all who would believe in him on his shoulders and to anybody who believes in him, he offers them his righteousness. And he takes their sin and their shame and he bears it gladly, allowing it to die with him and allowing us to become part of God's family, to be seen as righteous, to before God to become a son, to get the robes of Christ's righteousness that he laid down willingly. And when he looks at us, all that we have to do to receive that from him is to look at him and say, I believe that Jesus really did that and that he really did that for me. And that's it. There's nothing we can add to that, nothing to remove that, nothing that can make us lose that status then or lose that righteousness that Christ has credited to us from that point on because of any work that we can do. And so the question for us today is, do you believe that? That God loves you, that he wants you to be a part of his family, that he wants you to be with him. Like when you go and pray, he enjoys spending time with you. He enjoys just being around you. He loves your laugh because he made you laugh. He enjoys your personality because he created your personality. And now because you're clothed in the righteousness of his own son, Jesus, he loves you in the same way that he loves Jesus. Do we believe that? And do we live in that? 
Beyond that, looking at the world, do you believe that there are millions of people in our own city and billions of people around the world who have never even heard this message that we should bring this message to them? Because, yeah, maybe we look at them and we think that they don't deserve God's love. Or maybe we're worried that they're resistant to our message, even though many aren't resistant, many are open and searching for love and searching for hope. But if it's true that Christ looked on us when we had nothing to offer him and he loved us, and if he could save us, it means that he could save them. And that's the hope that the church offers the world. In fact, I'd, I'd argue that he saved us because he desires to save them. In the same way he looked at Abraham and said, I'm going to bless you so that you would bless the nations. He looks at us today and says, I'm going to make you my son and my daughter so that you will go forth and you will bless the nations, telling them of what Jesus has done for you. And so do we believe this? And so again, we wanted to take some time just on the back end of this message, just to give us time to reflect on this gospel truth. And so you'll see three questions on that paper. You can feel free to use that or write on it. You can write on your phone. You can just pray, just do whatever is comfortable to you. Um, but basically we're gonna go through a question. I'm gonna sit down for a couple of minutes and then I'll move us on to the next one. So the first question we're gonna look at is this. Um, not really as much of a question, but more just reflection is, take a moment to reflect on who you were before Jesus and praise him for his grace in your life. So again, sometimes for us to really remember the gospel, we have to remember all that Jesus saved us from and who we were before he found us and picked us up. And so if you can, just where you're at, just in prayer, just take some time to reflect where you were at, who you were before Jesus came into your life and take some time just to praise him and thank him for that. And then I'll come up in a couple of minutes and move us on to the next question. 